my goodness. Hi there. <laughs> Sorry. Things are a bit frenetic today. So many things going on at once. Instead of just having one thing break down, I've had four. <laughs> I'm frenetic, menopause Taylor today. But I am delivering anything but a frenetic education on menopause. On the contrary, this education is the most comprehensive, unbiased, and understandable menopause education you're going to find anywhere. Now that's partly due to the fact <laughs> that I am the only person delivering an education on menopause to women at all. <laughs> and it's partly due to the fact that I'm an anal, neurotic, pedantic, perfectionistic surgeon <laughs> who puts a lot of energy into making sure I do a good job for you. So this is video number 324, and it's the fifth video in our unit on endometrial uterine cancer. The unit started with video number 320 on the anatomy of your uterus and endometrial uterine cancer. Video 321 was on the incidence and prevalence of endometrial uterine cancer. Video number 322 was on the risk factors for endometrial uterine cancer. And video 323 was on estrogen as a definite cause of endometrial uterine cancer. But since there is one category of endometrial uterine cancer that falls outside the purview of either the risk factors or estrogen as a cause for it, today's video is on endometrial uterine cancer that is purely genetic. Its title is Frenetic Genetics as a Cause of Endometrial Uterine Cancer. It is so critical to watch my videos in order because failing to do so can really sabotage your entire my menopause education. So what I teach you here today pertains only to endometrial uterine cancers that are due to genetics. It's completely separate and distinct from what I've taught you in the videos thus far. You will not find this particular topic in my book. All of chapter 31 is on endometrial uterine cancer, but this topic on genetic endometrial uterine cancers is a video extra. Still, it's extremely important. And it's extremely important because a genetic component can change all the rules and all your options for treating not only the cancer itself, but also many other non-cancer gyne gynecologic problems. So let's just start with a review. In video number 322, you learn that there are only three risk factors for endometrial uterine cancer. You are at high risk for endometrial uterine cancer if you are old, fat, and female. Our acronym for that is OFF, or OFF. And in video number 323, you discovered that excess estrogen is a definite cause of endometrial uterine cancer. So, if you take estrogen all by itself, it can cause endometrial uterine cancer. But separate from what you've already learned, there is a special category of endometrial uterine cancer that is purely genetic, and it's due to frenetic genetics. Frenetic genetics is not an official term. I made it up. <laughs> it rhymes, frenetic and genetic. <laughs> but the key is that there are some uterine cancers that are part of a hereditary predisposition to endometrial uterine cancer and other cancers. As many as 20% of uterine cancers occur in women with strong family histories of cancer. And one of the most important aspects of your medical care is your family history. And the reasons for this are varied. I mean, sometimes people focus on family history more than they should. Other times they focus on family history less than they should. Well, when you consider your family history, always include both your mother's side and your father's side. Some diseases are pertinent to only one side. Others are pertinent to both. For our purposes today, you should consider both sides of your family. 
So would it surprise you to learn that a family history of all sorts of other cancers can put you at high risk of endometrial uterine cancer? Yep, that's what frenetic genetics is all about. The key is to know which other kinds of cancers have an effect <laughs> on your risk for endometrial uterine cancer. And they are not the ones you were, might, might expect to have an impact. As you consider your family history of diseases, the important cancers to assess with regard to endometrial uterine cancer due to frenetic genetics include colorectal cancer, small intestine cancer, stomach cancer, pancreatic cancer, bile duct cancer, bladder cancer, skin cancer, brain cancer, ovarian cancer, and uterine cancer. Can you believe it? There are cancers from head to toe associated with this frenetic thing. Brain, GI tract, reproductive, skin cancers. Frenetic, isn't it? If you have family members on either side of your family with any of these cancers, you should know that they could all be due to frenetic genetics. The official term for these cancers that are due to frenetic genetics is Lynch syndrome. Lynch syndrome is a set of genetic mutations that cause many different kinds of cancer in members of the same family. Do you remember these scars I used to explain hereditary and non-hereditary cancers in video number 318? Well, Lynch syndrome is a situation in which there are many different genetic mutations. So, instead of this, which is normal, you have this, and all the knots are mutations. And the mutations are autosomal dominant. Now, autosomal dominant means that you only have to inherit one gene from one of your parents in order to get the disease. This is in contrast to a trait that is autosomal recessive. Autosomal recessive means that you have to inherit a gene mutation from both parents in order to get the disease. So Lynch syndrome is a big deal if you have the mutations. When it comes to endometrial uterine cancers, 5% of them are due to Lynch syndrome. In determining whether or not you have Lynch syndrome mutations, you look at your personal history and two generations of your family medical history. So you would only consider yourself, your siblings, and your parents, your aunts, and your uncles. So on this board of a family tree, part of a family tree, the relatives of interest are you here waving, your siblings in your generation, and your parents and their siblings in the next generation. That's it. There are certain red flags for Lynch syndrome, and they include all the following in any relatives in those two generations of consideration. Colorectal cancer or endometrial uterine cancer in anyone before age 50 colorectal cancer in two or more generations on the same side of the family. Stomach cancer at any age in any relative. Ovarian cancer at any age in any relative. And two or more family members with any of the following cancers. Colorectal cancer, small intestine cancer, stomach cancer, pancreatic cancer, bile duct cancer, bladder cancer, skin cancer, brain cancer, ovarian cancer, or uterine cancer. The final red flag is any family member with a known genetic mutation for any of these cancers. The reason it's 
it's so important to identify Lynch syndrome is because all these cancers are preventable. It just requires a high risk management plan. Alternatively, these cancers can be diagnosed very early, which greatly improves survival. This means that being aware of your Lynch syndrome status could change both your risk for cancers and your management of diseases that are not cancers. Let me give you a couple of examples of how the frenetic genetics of Lynch syndrome can change your menopause management. In scenario one, let's say you are a 46-year-old perimenopausal woman who is having heavy periods due to multiple small fibroids that you've had for years. You've been watching my videos and you know that the heavy periods are typical of perimenopause, but it's just so inconvenient. You're an attorney and you just can't manage your heavy periods and heavy trials at the same time. So you decide you want to have the least invasive management possible, just to keep the bleeding controlled. You do not want a hysterectomy because of the longer recovery period, which might interfere with a big recovery from winning a case. <laughs> when you go to your gynecologist to request a non-invasive procedure, the gynecologist takes a thorough family history. As an attorney, you really wonder about the relevance of your family to your fibroids. But you tell the gynecologist that your younger brother had colon cancer and your aunt had uterine cancer. Based on those two relatives, your gynecologist says that they are red flags for Lynch syndrome. She informs you that if your relatives do have Lynch syndrome, you could have it too, in which case you would be at high risk of developing endometrial uterine cancer. She recommends that you have Lynch syndrome genetic testing before having any procedure for your heavy bleeding. You really want to jump up and shout objection, <laughs> but you contain yourself and relent to the testing. And what do you know? You test positive for Lynch syndrome. You feel like it's a travesty of justice. Your gynecologist explains that considering your Lynch syndrome mutations, you would be better off having a total hysterectomy, bilateral salpingo oophorectomy for your bleeding. And that would entail removing your uterus, erasing your uterine cancer risk, your cervix, erasing any cervical cancer risk, your ovaries, nearly erasing your ovarian cancer risk, and even lowering your breast cancer risk by 50%. While not included in your Lynch syndrome risks, it would also eliminate the risk of cervical and fallopian tube cancers. And your doctor also recommends that you have annual colonoscopies to ensure colon cancer does not develop without notice. As much as you hate to admit it, you realize that your best chance at winning this case is to have the total hysterectomy, bilateral salpingo oophorectomy, and that's what you do. For scenario two, Let's say you are a 65-year-old postmenopausal woman with uterine prolapse. That's where your uterus starts to push downward as if it's trying to deliver itself through your vagina. You were not sexually active because your husband died two years ago. And you really just want the most minimally invasive procedure possible to avoid feeling the downward pressure of your uterus. You've read about outpatient procedures that can tighten up your vagina, and that's what you want. You really don't want to have a big surgical procedure because you have other medical problems that make recovery more difficult. You're 50 pounds overweight, and you're a smoker, both of which increase your risk. And you want a quick recovery so that you can fly across the country in a month to see your new grandbaby. When your doctor starts asking you about your family history, you assume it's because you just mentioned your new grandbaby and you tell them that your father had stomach cancer, your aunt had skin cancer, and your sister had ovarian cancer. Based on that, your doctor says, these are red flags for Lynch syndrome and suggests you get tested for it. 
the test result is positive and you change your surgical plans to undergo a total hysterectomy, bilateral salpingo oophorectomy. You also get heightened surveillance for ovarian cancer, skin cancer, stomach, and colorectal cancers. And by doing so, you avoid these cancers or you find them early. So what you see in these two scenarios is how Lynch syndrome can change the best management for even a benign, minor gynecologic problem. That's why it's so important to know if you have the frenetic genetics for it. And you know, it's not at all uncommon for the pathologist to discover occult cancers when a patient with frenetic genetics chooses to have what she intends to be a risk-reducing surgery. Risk-reducing surgery is any procedure that reduces your risk for a genetic cancer. The two case scenarios I just gave you would end up being examples as risk-reducing surgeries. In both situations, the surgery constituted more than was absolutely necessary under the clinical circumstances. And both significantly reduced the risk of frenetic genetic cancers. But sometimes, even though everything looks completely normal at the time of the surgery, the pathologist discovers microscopic cancer that was already there when he examines the tissue under the microscope. And had it not been for the patient's decision to have the risk-reducing surgery, they would have ended up with full-blown cancer. So think of occult cancer as an unexpected surprise that is discovered after the organ has been removed. It constitutes the true definition of a close call. So before you schedule conservative surgery for any gynecologic problem, make sure you consider your family history to rule out the likelihood of frenetic genetics that could conserve your potential for an unwanted cancer. While frenetic genetics is a rare cause of endometrial uterine cancer, it's important because it puts you at risk for a whole host of other cancers. In this unit on endometrial uterine cancer, I think it's important for you to know that it exists. So to summarize, in addition to estrogen itself as a definite cause of endometrial uterine cancer, and the three risk factors for endometrial uterine cancer, which include being old, fat, and female, frenetic genetics can also cause endometrial uterine cancer. Alrighty, dearies, that's enough freneticism for today. In the next video tutorial, I'll teach you about the pathology that occurs with endometrial uterine cancer. If you find this whole menopause mess frenetic, just schedule a consultation with me at menopausetaylor.me. I will erase the frenetic stuff. You can find me in an unfrenetic state on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And there's absolutely nothing frenetic about subscribing to this channel and my newsletter. It takes but a second and will be one of the best things you can do, along with coming back in a week. <laughs> Bye!